All right. Good morning. Welcome back. Welcome to the cold, cold morning. Huh? So, uh, <clears throat> so before starting, I just wanted to announce, I, I did post it on Piazza, but the first programming assignment is out. And the uh, first thing you all want to do is create your groups and register for a group in UB Learns because that's how we grade the group assignment. So just pick up the first available group and add yourself and your team members there. There is one undergraduate student uh, who is still looking for a group. Uh, I forgot his name. But uh, if anyone is in the undergrad class looking for a group member, he's available. I'll, I'll post his name on Piazza as well. I think he, he had posted himself as well. All right. Any questions before we begin? Okay, so let's get started with perceptrons. All right. That's too dark. I need to be able to see you. All right. So I, I just put the perceptron algorithm up there uh, that I uh, sort of went through last time. But <clears throat> I'm going to do a little bit of uh, thing on the paper so, to make you understand a little more. All right. So the perceptron algorithm, in a sense, is very similar to the Vino algorithm. In the sense, it's trying to learn a weight vector, right? And what it means is that it is trying to learn a line that can be drawn to distinguish between these two types of points. So that later, when a new point comes, you can test where does it lie with respect to the line and tell that it's a positive or a negative example, all right? So our problem setting is very much the same as before. Uh, well, it has changed a little bit. So you, you have your training data x, right? Now we say that x belongs to r to the power uh, small d, which essentially means that x is a vector with d elements in it, and each element is a real number, okay? So that is, a, uh, that is an extension from before. Earlier we were looking at binary and uh, binary uh, classes, uh, binary attributes. And then we say that we also have a class label assigned to x, which can either be plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So from now on, we will be focusing on the plus 1, minus 1, because here, what you'll see in the algorithm that the, this value also matters. Earlier, I used to say that it could be positive or negative, 1 or 0, and it could still be. But the way the algorithm is written in our slides, it needs to, we need to make sure that our data, the labels are like this, plus one and minus one. But it still is the same sense, right? You can say, okay, plus one means malignant and minus one means benign. So semantically, it could mean any two classes, but uh, for, math, for our math, we need to make sure that we write it like this, all right? And now our task is to learn the boundary, right? So, so let me go back to the, <coughs> to the algorithm. So the algorithm works like this. It's, it starts with all weights as zero, right? So what it wants to learn is a W vector, right? And as I, sh as I told you earlier, is that to account for the bias term, we append another attribute into our uh, data. So what we do is that our data is like this, right? So let's say our D is two, right? So let's say our data points are 0 0.7, 0 0.3. So this is x1, this is x2, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0.5, minus 0 0.3, 2.2. It could be anything, right? So let's say this is our data. And we also have some labels for them, right? So it's plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So this is our training data. Now we are trying to learn a line. <clears throat> so what we do, it's just a trick that we play, is that we append another attribute here. We call it x3. But all the values here are 1, right? So this is what we do to eliminate the bias, right? So what's happening here is we are now converting our data into a d plus 1. We are putting it in a d plus 1 space instead of a d space, such that the algorithm there would learn a plane in the d plus 1 dimensional space, which will pass through the origin, all right? And what it essentially means is that whatever w it will learn, which will also be in r to power d plus 1, you can then go back to the d-dimensional space, which means that if you, if this was your w, 
right? In this case, W would only have three three values, right? Let's say it was 0 0.7, 2.4, 2.5, and 3.2, right? Let's say this is what came out. <clears throat> what this means is that this plane, right, will pass through the origin in the three-dimensional space. But when you map it to the two-dimensional space, because the original data was in two dimension, it would be a line with this as the weights. So it will be W transpose X equal to minus 3.2. So whatever you learn, the third feature would actually be the bias term in the lower space. So that's just a trick because that way the algorithms can be written in a slightly nicer way. So uh, let me give you a feel for that. So if we had assumed, so here in this algorithm we assume that we have already incorporated the bias, which means that we only have to learn this W vector, right? If we had not incorporated the bias, I would have had to write uh, updates for W and for theta as well. So it's just to make it a little cleaner, but otherwise it's the same. You can write perceptron learning algorithm without eliminating the bias. So don't get confused with that. All right. Okay. So now let's see what happens with this algorithm. Right? So every time what happens is, go back. <clears throat> so let's assume that uh, this is our data. Let's say our data is in two-dimensional space, right? But uh, uh, so let's say, and we have eliminated the bias. Let's say it was originally in one dimensional. So uh, essentially here I'm assuming that the line would pass through the origin, right? So let's say these are my positive points. And these are my negative points. And I want to learn a line, right? So what perceptron does is that first it starts with an arbitrary line, could be anything. Then when it sees the first example, let's say, let's say this is the first x1, it so, and it has some arbitrary initialization of w. So it computes w transpose x of 1, right? And then the perceptron, the classification rule is that if this is greater than zero, then it is a positive example, greater than or equal to zero, right? So if it is, then you give it a positive uh, class. Then you check, is it really a positive class? So if it is, then you don't do anything, right? But let's say it so happens that it is a negative example. So then what you do is you uh, you'd update the equation of your line. Let's, so whenever there's a mistake, you update the equation of the line to move the line. So whenever I change W, what will happen is that, let's say at some point the line was like this. Okay. So the line was like this <clears throat> and it made a mistake. So whenever it makes a mistake, what it will do is it will rotate the line a little bit. Because when you change W, it essentially means that you're rotating it, right? Uh, so it rotates it so that now it accommodates the negative example, right? And then it keeps doing that until it doesn't make any more mistakes. So that's the idea, right? So that is written mathematically in this. So you can actually, and I showed you the Python code, sorry, how to do that. So whenever, so the main point here is line number nine, right? So whenever there's a mistake, you change W, to w plus c star x of i times x of i. So that is important, right? So what's happening here is that when there is a mistake, for a mistake, w becomes w plus c star x of i times x of i, right? So, of course, C star of X of I can be either positive or negative, right? Because these are the true classes. So, in either of the case, so if it is a positive, so let C star X of I be positive, right? Which means that you made a mistake on a positive instance. It was actually positive or plus one. In that case, W will be W plus X of I. So, you are just adding this is a bitwise and uh, bitwise addition right so w is a vector x is a vector you're just adding the corresponding elements 
So you just add things and it will rotate, right? And if, see, and um, if CSI be negative, then W becomes W minus X of R. So then you are basically uh, moving it in the other direction. All right, so that's the only effect that it has. So it's a very simple algorithm, but it, it works if your data is separable. That means there is a line to be learned, right? And then the next question somebody asked was, how many mistakes would it make before it converged? And then what we said was that, yes, there is some result like to do that, but it assumes something. So to get give you a feel of that, let me draw something again. So let's say uh, these are your two axes, x1 and x2, right? So Marvin Minsky, who is a, was a famous uh, AI person at MIT, who is sort of uh, one of the pioneers in AI, right? And he just died two weeks back. Uh, he was the one who sort of took up perceptrons and, uh, you know, analyzed it a, a lot. And then he also wrote a book called Perceptrons. Right? Actually, perceptrons were developed in Buffalo. There was a, there was a company uh, near the airport. If you go to the airport, you see a big tank there. It says Calspan. So that Calspan company, there was a guy called Frank Rosenblatt who used to uh, work there. And he was the first guy who implemented it in a machine. So, so there's a bit of a history with Buffalo. So anyway, so what, so what Marvin Minsky said was that I can prove the bounds if you give me some constraints. So some of the constraints that he asked for was that all the data lies on a unit circle. That means that uh, everything is like this. So there are positive instances like that. And there are negative instances like this, right? And then you, uh, it's, then they can uh, prove how many mistakes would you make before you make a line which perfectly distinguishes between the two type of points, right? Uh, but the problem there was that if your data is like this, let's say there are, oh, sorry, if there are a lot of positive, positive, positive instances here because you could have infinite number of instances in a very small space, right? right and this is the line that you want to draw right then it would make many mistakes before it really adjusts right because what will happen is that let's say the line initially was like this then it makes a mistake it will move it a little bit then again mistake move it a little bit and it will keep moving it to the right place but it could potentially make a lot of mistakes right because you can you can inject infinite number of points in that crucial area where it has to make the decision, right? So, which means that the number of mistakes is not only a uh, property of the uh, algorithm, but also the property of the data set itself, right? So, what Marvin Minsky said was that I can give you a bound if you can give me a guarantee that there is a positive space where there are no points, positive space around the line where there are no points, then I can learn this line. And what he showed was that he, you can learn this line by making these many mistakes, okay? So which essentially means is that if this is very large, right? If there were, if the gap was very large, all the positive were here and all the negative were here, then you could learn this line with very few mistakes because this value would be very small. But if this gap was very small, then you would have to make a lot of mistakes before you reach the answer. But whatever it may be, there is a result like that, which shows you that these are the number of mistakes you would make in perceptron okay any questions yes uh, no, no so the question is does the larger gap um, mean a less accurate algorithm uh, the answer is uh, no so for example let's say all your positive points are here right and all your negative points are here right now, now the gap is a lot. Let's say your uh, the line that you want to learn is this. There's a huge gap here, so your delta is very large, right? 
now the line that you learn would still be accurate because you are assuming that there will no, not be any points in this space, right? So it will still be accurate. So this is just for the theoretical analysis. In reality, you cannot make claims like that, right? And that is the problem sort of perceptrons, perceptrons fell out of favor because of this weird property that they can only learn well if you can assume that the data is very far away. I mean, two types of points are very far away in that whatever space. Otherwise, they cannot learn without making too many mistakes. And uh, so the Perceptron's book essentially was, you might think it was written to promote Perceptron's, but that's probably the reason they sort of fell away. All right. Okay. So let's move on. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. What is delta design? Delta is the space that you assume is present between the positive and negative points, right? So if you can assume that, then you can give some guarantees about how perceptron converges. Yes. Is there a Is there a, a, oh, here. This is the big O notation. And this one? Yeah. This is an O. Ah, okay. Oh, that's a big O. So it's okay. sort of asymptotically that those many mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Excellent question because that's my next uh, next point. So your, your question is what happens if the data is not separable, right? And perfect. So I'm, I'm going to answer that in the next uh, five minutes. All right. So with that question, um, I want to start the next topic. So basically that is our next step in machine learning. Okay. So, so far we were still sort of um, uh, staying in this, uh, in this space. So we have looked at uh, so far, we have looked at hypothesis spaces uh, like conjunctive spaces, disjunctive spaces, monotone disjunctions, and we have also looked at linear hyperplanes, right, which, uh, which was perceptrons. We have look, looked at two types of data. We have looked at binary data. We have looked at uh, real uh, vectors. And so far, we have looked at input space, which is still binary, all right? So the next question becomes, but so far, we have assumed that our answer, the the right answer is in the hypothesis space, okay? But what if this is not true, right? So that brings us to this step, which means what if C star, which is the right answer that you're looking for, the target concept does not belong to the hypothesis space that you assume it is in, right? So what if it is not disjunctive or conjunctive or in this case, what if it's not a linear hyperplane, which essentially means what if the data is not separable by a line, all right? So that can we come up with algorithms that can still work? And that brings in, brings in a lot of interesting questions. So we will move to that. Uh, another thing that we will move to later on, not today, but maybe in two, three weeks is, what if our target is not binary? It's a number. So that be becomes a problem of prediction or regression. But uh, that, that comes three weeks, uh, four weeks later. All right. So the point is, what happens if the data is non-separable? So whenever I say non-separable, that means you cannot draw a line to separate it. You can draw a curve, but not a line, right? So it turns out that you can adapt the perceptron algorithm to learn in that setting as well. But we need to make some changes, all right? So for example, this is a very uh, trivial example. If your data has only two, four points, two of them are on this side and two of them are on that side, you cannot separate them, right? And that's a perfectly non-separable case. How can we learn our concept, right? So one possibility is we can expand our hypothesis space. We can say, instead of learning uh, a line, let's try to learn non-linear curves, right? But we have seen that that becomes more complex. The other thing that we can do, which we have not looked at so far, is we can learn something which might not be perfect on training data, all right? So that brings in the principle of good enough, right? You do not have to be perfect, but you have to be good enough. And then that brings in the question that, how do you measure the good goodness? And when do you say that this is good enough, all right? So let me give you an example here. So for example, this is an, uh, 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 a two-dimensional example again. So you have two attributes, x1 and x2. You have some negative points, some positive points, and you can clearly see that you cannot draw a line that differentiates these two types of points, right? If you have two-dimensional data, uh, the easy test to do this is to draw a, 
a convex polygon you know what do you call that a convex hull right so if you stick pins in all of these points and you put a elastic band elastic band if they if they intersect then that means that this uh, data set is not linearly separable right now how do i learn a line right so for example uh, in fact i want to make a case here non separable case when I say non-separable, I mean non-separable by a line, right? You can always separate it by a curve, but here we are just talking about uh, by a line. So let's say uh, these are all my negative data points, and these are all my positive points, right? And clearly, I cannot draw a line that separates the two. So now what are my options? I, I still want to draw a line because I want to stay in that hypothesis space, but my right answer is not in that hypothesis space. So I want to find the answer that is closest enough to the right answer, which means now, so I have many options, right? I can draw a line like this. I can draw a line like this. I can draw a line like this. Right? So which line do I choose? Yeah. So the way to choose one of the best line is to first measure the error that you're getting on your training data. So for example, if I choose a line like this, right, everything here is negative, everything here is positive. It means that I'm, I'm going to misclassify this, 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 and this point, right? I'm going to make more four mistakes. If I choose this line, then I probably going to make more mistakes than before. Uh, so there would be one line which would give us the minimum number of mistakes. Right? And that's the line that we want to choose. All right. So that is the key principle of good enough. Principle principle of good enough that I came up with this morning is that you want to come up with the answer that is the best, but not perfect, because there is no perfect answer. All right. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, line, not... Good question. So the question is, there could be multiple lines that are good enough. I mean, they would have the exact error. Right? And there, I, I guess you would have to be arbitrary. You can choose any answer. But then there are other algorithms which would differentiate between those as well, which we will come to next uh, two months later under the support vector machine assumption. But here we are assuming that if there are four or five lines that are making the same number of mistakes, say, okay, that's fine. You choose any one of them. So for example, if uh, let's say these are your positive points, these are your one type of points, right? And these are your other type of points. And there's one point here, right? Which means that you can never draw a line. So now this line would also make the same number of mistakes. This line would also make the impact. There could be infinite lines that could make same number of mistakes. Uh, in the perceptron algorithm that we will see, it will just learn whatever the first line it finds, right? Uh, but later we'll see that even here you want to probably choose the line that's right in the middle, uh, but uh, we, we'll come to that later. All right, any questions so far? All right, so this is actually a very important point of our course because this is where I introduce the notion of errors, All right? So, so, so the question again is which hyperplane or which line to choose? The answer is we want to choose the one that gives us the best performance, right? But now how do we choose that mathematically or how can we write a code to choose that line, right? So that is done by posing this problem as an optimization problem. Now I'm assuming that you're all familiar with optimization as a mathematical concept, right? So if you have a function f of x and you want to find the x where fx is either the most or the lowest, right? That is called optimization, right? and we do it in our life all the time. We are optimizing over different things, but mathematically there are algorithms to do that. right? So the point is that you can pose this problem as an optimization function, optimization problem. The core of an optimization problem is an objective function. There is an objective function or an error function or a penalty function or a reward function that you are trying to optimize. You are trying to maximize your rewards or minimize your regret or minimize your losses, right? So first we need to figure out what is our objective function. And then once you have a function, 
what is that mathematical algorithm to reach the minimum or maximum, right? So we'll, we'll see that for perceptrons. All right. So remember, this is another view of the perceptron, right? A perceptron looks like this. So there is, in fact, we are going to look at it uh, uh, in, a, in a slightly different context, sorry. We are going to assume that our output, right, y is real. It's not plus one or minus one, it could be any value, right? And the input is again d-dimensional vector. And now you are trying, so this is, these are your training examples. You are trying to find a weight w, right, which determines your line. So the error function that you are trying to minimize here is the squared loss. That means whatever is the output of w transpose xi should be as close to the real answer as possible, right. So I'm, I'm going to uh, take some time to explain this because this is the key. So you see, so far, most of the algorithms that we have seen are, are more of like the logic based algorithms. We are trying to do this ands and ors. But now comes the real machine learning algorithms where you are trying to do some kind of optimization, right? So let's say I am given some training data, right? Training data has x and y, right? Uh, so this could be like x1, well, so this is x of 1, x of 1 will be x1, x of 1, x2, let's say there are 3 attributes, t equal to 3. And we can assume that this includes a bias as well, doesn't matter. So this is our training data, right? add one more. And then these are the, uh, the outputs, the thing that we are trying to classify. Now these could be binary, these could be um, y could be binary or a real number, right, doesn't matter in this case. That's why we call it an unthresholded perceptron. Because in perceptron, we also have that threshold, right? We do, is it greater than zero or not? But here we are just saying uh, it could be anything, right? So now, how do I measure the loss, right? So I measure the loss with respect to some W, right? So assume that W is the, is the plane that we have learned, right? We have learned a plane already, right? So how do I measure the loss, right? So the loss will be measured by first taking what are my predictions. So for example, if this is my x of 1 and this is w, then the prediction, the, the uh, how do I call it, uh, c, right? Remember, c of x of 1 will be w transpose x of 1, right? Because that's our, uh, that's our prediction or classification rule. Uh, c of x of 2 will be w transpose x of 2, c of x of 3 is w transpose x of 3, and c of x of 4 is w transpose x of 4, right? Any questions so far? So these are the outputs. Now the, a good w will be one which, in which all of these are very similar to all of these, right? Because you want to minimize your losses. So in the training data, the training data tells you that this is the prediction and your W gives these as the prediction, right? Which means that your loss, a good W should, so uh, the loss, the loss can be measured as this. You take your W transpose X of 1 and you compare it with your Y of 1. Ah. <coughs> These are the training uh, labels. So this minus this, right? And you put an, you can put an absolute value here, or you can put a square because you just want to make the magnitude uh, uh, as close as possible. The loss on the second training example would be x of two. I don't know why I'm putting extra square plus y three minus w transpose. 
x of 3 square plus y 4 minus w transpose 4 square right so I'm just measuring my loss right and mathematically uh, just in a compact way you can write it as a summation i equal to 1 to 4 y of i minus w transpose x of i square right so this is the loss and sometimes we also put a half here it doesn't really uh, make much difference it only helps us in the in the mathematics but i'll come to that later but this is how we measure the loss so essentially what we want is we want to somehow find the w which gives us the minimum loss right and the reason we are posing it like this is then we can use this vast literature available for optimization mathematical optimization to find that w right so think of this loss as some loss function l of w it's a function of w and which is which looks like this so you can use any optimization methodology and we'll, we'll look at those to find the w that minimizes this. okay any questions so far so it, it looks like this remember so mathematically we are going to write this as our uh, loss function so e e is for error okay so error of w is half times squared loss over all training data okay so this is our loss function and all right so uh, any questions so far yes so we don't know the value of w what we are saying is that for any w this would be the loss so in our training we will try to find the w that minimizes this loss all right so w what we have done is we have we know what y and x are these are the training data we have been given those but w is unknown and w is what we want to learn right that's the line that we want to draw so that is unknown and we will try to find it well we will find it yes what is y? y is your uh, label output label yeah i'm sorry about the sub earlier i was using superscripts here i have subscripts but uh, essentially x of i denotes the ith training example and y of i is the label or the prediction for that yes right right so here we are assuming that our prediction could be any real number so you have changed it a little bit but we can change you can still get a uh, like a binary prediction by saying if it's greater than zero call it plus one less than zero call it minus one so you can compute that but to compute the error we still choose the unthresholded value just the raw value so that makes it a smooth function another question well that assumption is there if we have included the bias in x right so if we have then it will pass through zero yeah so for now we'll assume that it is passing through zero which means that we have x also includes the bias term in fact a lot of times what they do is they'll just add a bias term here to show that so let's assume that x4 is the bias term always equal to one question I'll come to that. That just makes our uh, mathematics a little cleaner. But it doesn't matter because you try to minimize half of this or the full of this or any constant times this, it's, it will give you the same number. So that doesn't matter. But it will, you will see that it helps us uh, cancel some things out. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. We do because see uh, because the W will have D plus one entries. So when you have to make a inner product, the X should also have D plus one entries. There won't be any Y four. Uh, well, it's actually my mistake. Uh, we should be using uh, superscripts here. Mm. So let's let's forget about this slide. I'm gonna 
write it here. So this is how you want to consider your neural network, okay? There is x, so this is x1, these are the attributes, right? These are not the data points, but the attributes. So this is all one, one f set of attributes. So let's say you have d equal to 4, right? So then what you'll do is you'll add another bias term. This is a bias term. And this will always be 1. So that's how you add the bias, right? And the way perceptrons work is that it takes all of these and it does a W transpose X, this whole vector, right? And then, it, so this is our prediction and then we compare it with the, with the output. Now the training examples are X of 1, Y of 1, X of 2, Y of 2, X of some N, let's say you have N data points, right? Y of N. So the this output is associated with the entire data point, not with every attribute. You see what I mean? See, this X of 1 is essentially X 1, 1, X 1, 2, three x d plus one one right? and this value is one of course it's a bias term but this is the vector and this is the output associated with it and we are trying to compute an error So this is our error, right? So uh, so the bias term is already in here, and the corresponding W is in here. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. W transpose X will always be a scalar value, right? A dot product will always give you a number because it's a dot product. Right. Yes. Yes. And you want to find the W that minimizes the total error. All right. Yes. There will be a weight corresponding to the bias term as well. So remember this W transpose X, essentially it means that think of these as wires coming in, right? So there is a weight vector, there's a weight value on each wire. So what's happening is when the current passes through this, it gets multiplied with this and gets added up, right? So for the bias term also, there will be automatically a W term. All right. All right. So now how do we do this, right? So the next question, how we do that? So the answer is we use mathematical optimization, right? as I said. So let me quickly give you a recap of that. So machine learning in general is mostly posed as an optimization problem because in real world that will never happen that you have a perfect line or a curve or anything right which means that what you want to find is an answer that is the best and to get the best you typically have an error function that you want to minimize or a reward function that you want to maximize and then you apply a mathematical optimization on it right so this is the core sort of a concept that you need to understand machine learning so, and there has been a lot of research how to do it faster, how to do it better and everything, right? So, in general, optimization from mathematical, um, from math back, um, perspective is like this, right? You have some function of some arguments W and you want to find the value of W that minimizes this. And in some cases, you can also find which maximizes it. Subject to some constraints. Sometimes you want some constraints on W as well. Right? So that's a standard optimization formulation. Sometimes you do not have these constraints. Then it's called an unconstrained optimization. So for example, here, this, we are posing it as an unconstrained optimization. We are saying, find me a W that minimizes this. I do not care what the properties of W are, right? So it's unconstrained. 
But in some cases, you might want to put some constraint, in which case you would have to come up with other ways to do that. All right. So there are many ways to do this, right? A whole mathematical uh, discipline there. Uh, there are algorithms like Newton descent, uh, gradient descent, Newton Raphson. There are also general methods like uh, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms. You don't have to really know any of these. I don't know many of these either. But uh, there are a lot of them, right? But these methods, these general methods don't work very well because they don't make many assumptions, which means that they don't really uh, find the right answer uh, in many cases. But then there's a whole class of optimization algorithms which assume that the problem has some structure, okay? Typically, the structure they need is convexity, and I'll come to convexity, and smoothness, and this continuity, so your function needs to be continuous, it needs to be smooth and convex. Then there are many algorithms, like the ones that I listed, uh, gradient descent and all of these, that can find you the right answer, right? So what is convexity? So convexity essentially means, uh, so there's a notion of convex set, right? A set is convex, if you cannot uh, draw a line between any two points, so that, that any part of the line falls outside, right? So that's sort of an easy definition of a convex set. But the reason convexity is a very important property for uh, optimization is because it guarantees that your data has some minima or maxima, right? If, if your function is, you know, all over the place, then it's hard to find the right answer. So, so let's say this is your w, let's say your w has only one value, and this is your e of w, the function, right? So a convex function would look like this, which means that, yes, there is a, a, a point which is the minima, right? So it's easy to find. But you could have another function that looks like this, and here this is not convex. And because it's not convex, it's hard to find the minima, because... Uh, this could be the minima, but locally this could be the minima as well. So that's a problem. So there are a lot of mathematical tools to do optimization, which assume that your function is convex. All right. So that's a convexity property. In our case, and then there are a lot of functions that are naturally convex. So typically if a function has a polynomial in it like this, or a log or an exponent, then it tends to be convex, right? So in our case, our function, our uh, error function is also convex. That means that we can use some of these simpler optimization methods that exploit that convexity property, all right? So now how do we find the answer if the function is convex, right? And you might know that, right? So if I give you a function fx, If I give you a function fx, right, how do you find its minima? How do you find uh, the x where fx is minimum? Right, so you take the derivative of the function and you set it to 0, right? And once you set it to 0, then you find the x that gives you the answer and that's the optimal value. And then typically you also compute the second order derivative. And that tells you if it's a maxima or a minima or a saddle point, right? So that those things you know. In our case, the issue is that our x is not a single value. So the function is not like this. This is x and this is fx. That's an easy setting, right? In our ca case, our x is actually w, right? So we want to compute e of w, but w is... R of D, uh, R of D, right? So you want to find the, so how do I find the derivative of a function with respect to a vector, right? So typically that is written as, the we call that the gradient of this function. So you can write it as the derivative of the function with respect to this vector. Gradient. Right? So essentially what we are doing is that we have a function. Now the function value is a number, right? The error 
is just a number it is a scalar value but it is a function of a vector so when we compute the the gradient the answer will also be a vector so the easy way to do that is like this so let's say uh, so this is your e of w e of w is a number but you want to take a derivative of that with respect to w where w is actually a vector w1 w2 wd right so what you do is the answer of this would be you take the derivative of this with respect to each element of this vector right and then you stack them all into one vector so d of d uh, partial derivative of d with respect to this with respect to this so on mm, d so this is called the gradient of this function all right and this is a vector remember that right so uh, try to brush up some of your matrix calculus concepts as well because la later we'll also try to see what is the uh, double derivative the second order derivative of uh, of a function so if i want to do d square dw square of e of w then i won't comp compute it right now but this actually is going to be a matrix and that's called a hessian right so uh, and that will be uh, needed as well because in optimization we want to do that right so so that's the point so uh, before any questions so far yeah yes yeah, well in in right right so we are assuming so, so okay good point so what we are going to do the reason i'm telling you all of this is that now what we will do is that we have our e of w right e of w is half of y of i minus uh, w transpose x x of i square right we are going to assume that this is convex in this case it is convex and then we are going to uh, write a derivative uh, write a optimization function that can find you the best w all right so that's our sort of the the next plan yes we just put it uh, you will see that it helps us do the uh, differentiation a little bit not helps but this makes it cleaner so let us try to do that right so well actually i don't want to do that today because i need to tell you about the gradient descent so gradient descent is one algorithm to do that mathematical optimization okay so the way it works is see uh, uh, i showed you earlier that if you had a function of only one attribute f of x right you can apply f prime x equal to 0 and get the optimal value but if you have multi dimensional attributes then it's not easy to set it to 0 and get some answer right so the and the way to do that is what we call gradient descent so the way gradient descent works is that let's say this is your function okay this is your weight number 1 weight number 2 and this is your error function right so this this mesh is your function and you're trying to find the minima automatically right so the way we uh, gradient descent works is that think of it as like a you're trying to hill climbing or hill you're sort of going down a hill and you want to reach the bottom of the hill right and it's you know it's a crucible kind of thing and you are blindfolded you don't know which direction to go right now how do you reach down the only thing you can do is that at every step your eyes are closed you basically take a small step around you and wherever you see the biggest drop you sort of keep moving in that direction right so that's called the gradient descent so you move along the direction where you see the biggest drop right and that way you are hoping that you will reach the bottom right and if the function is smooth and convex you will reach the bottom you might take a lot of steps but you will reach the bottom right so that algorithm is also called the gradient descent algorithm because mathematically now for me i can just sort of take a step around and say okay here is where i get the most drop but mathematically how do you find the direction in which you are getting the most drop the way you do that is you compute the gradient at that point right and you move along the gradient because remember what is gradient gradient tells you the direction uh, you know the line that you draw uh, that's tangent to the curve at that point right and that tells you the direction where the flow is going right so that is the direction you move 
So that is called the gradient descent algorithm. Gradient descent algorithm is a general algorithm. It's not like it's a toolbox which you can just take and apply, right? You have to compute the gradient of your function. And next class we will see how to compute the gradient of this function. It's pretty easy, but uh, we'll still go through the steps, right? And that will help us give us the direction in which we have to move. And then we can apply the gradient descent methodology to reach the minimum and find the answer. All right, any questions so far? Yes. In the Hessian? 